Hello, my name is Maureen Farrell and I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Glasgow in the School of Education and I'm here today to talk about Scottish graphic novels. What better way to start the presentation than by offering you a version of uh, the graphic novel shown as a graphic novel form. I wish I could take the credit for creating this slide, but I'm afraid I did not. So just to go over the basics with you, graphic novels are books that involve, surprise, surprise, graphics, and they consist of sequential art or comics of any style, not always novels, more like a short story or a novella. And they're not always um, fiction also. They take space to tell a story. A graphic novel should be original or creative with the medium in some way, rather than rehashing the familiar comic book story tropes. Original graphic novels um, in a serialized form um, with the intention of, of turning them into books are called assembled graphic novels. You can also get comic book miniseries. And if you do get a comic book series, they will often contain story arcs that can stand on their own uh, within a single volume. Within a graphic novel, a page should be seen as a visual composition, a series of events in a single unified space. The strips dividing the space into panels, each of which is a distinct moment or process in time. In book form, the page is constituted as a matrix of identical square panels. The strips constitute a narrative breakdown and the strips to books is back to that kind of idea of reassembling them into a larger text. The text slows the eye down while the images demand to be taken in all at once. And you'll find that young readers of comics and graphic novels are very sophisticated at this and have no difficulty uh, with that complex uh, process. The text um, is usually read from left to right um, in Western society particularly, but if they are fans of manga or anime um, from Japan, um, if they read any of those, then they will, will be read from left to right. Um, and the images, they, they come from the back of the book. The images in a graphic novel allow the eye to dart from one locus of intensity to another. There is one particular phrase called mise en page, which is a technical term that you might find useful to know. And that means the arrangements of the elements in the space on a page. There are other more technical terms, but I don't plan to go through them this afternoon. For the purposes of this talk, I have used the following guidelines for selecting the graphic novels. I, they are either set in Scotland, they are about a clearly Scottish topic, either in history or in geography, in folklore, or perhaps concerning Scottish people about a Scottish biography, or it's got a particular Scottish story. It's either by a Scottish writer or a Scottish artist, or it is published in Scotland. And the, the companies I've particularly focused on today are three. These are 404 Inc, BHP and Diamond Steel Comics, all of which public uh, publish graphic novels that I am talking about uh, today. I've started with the idea of looking at classic Scottish texts that have been made into graphic novels. And the one I'm starting with is Treasure Island. Um, you'll find that most of the texts on this page are, are written by Robert Louis Stevenson. You'll see that um, the Treasure Island text got two different versions here. The first one on the left has a very much uh, a traditional format like uh, the uh, information that was on the second slide. It's, it uses speech bubbles, it uses thought bubbles, and it has commentary in boxes on the page within the frame of the, of the comic. In the second one, uh, that version of Treasure Island, I picked that one to show you because 
it uses different forms of graphic novel presentation in, in different chapters. So for some chapters, it does use the standard graphic novel form of um, speech bubbles and thought bubbles and so on. But in other chapters, what it has is got a series of pictures with a block of text underneath the pictures and no direct speech, but it's more reported speech and um, within that. So it's just to show you there are different kinds of um, uh, text. The next one I want to look at is um, two graphic novel versions of Kidnapped. And you'll see these, um, one on the left is the graphic novel in standard English. And the one on the right is um, Kidnap It. It's the version commissioned by, um, uh, for, in order to celebrate Edinburgh being commissioned as a UNESCO city of literature. And um, it was um, published and then distributed around um, Edinburgh in celebration of that. So you can see the two contrasting versions of the same graphic novel. I've also chosen to give you a, uh, a version of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Now, this is actually one of the most um, varied uh, graphic novels that I've come across. It's got multiple graphic novel versions of it. I've just given you two to have a look at. The one on the left is um, written by an American, Jerry Kramsky, and is illustrated by Lorenzo Matotti. Um, and you'll see it's a very kind of cartoony version with the Hyde character uh, taking up much of the front page um, in cartoonish form almost. The one on the right is um, was written by Alan Grant and uh, Cam Kennedy. And again, it's one that was a commissioned piece and it is a much darker version, a much, uh, I think, much creepier version of the novel. And again, I just wanted to let you to have a look at uh, some of the versions of these classic texts that are available. The last one I want to look at in terms of classic texts is the book Peter Pan. And I've again, there are various versions of graphic novels of this, but I particularly have chosen the 2015 um, BC uh, books version. That's now BC is um, Berlin Publishers Children's Imprint, and they released the first official UK graphic novel of J.M. Barry's uh, Peter Pan. Uh, the artist is Stephen White, also known as Streff, uh, with the help of color, colorist Finn Cram. Now, J.M. Barry um, originally used the Peter Pan character within a section of his 1902 adult novel called The Little White Bird, before then focusing on the character in a stage play entitled Peter Pan, or The Boy Who Wouldn't Grow Up, which premiered late in 1904. The popularity of the play led to the Peter Pan section of The Little White Bird being published separately in 1906 as Peter Pan in Kensington Gardens with illustrations by Arthur Rackham. The novel that we now call Peter Pan was an expanded version of the play, which was originally published in 1911 as Peter and Wendy. And I think for me, the interesting thing about Peter Pan is that like the character that never grows up, I almost feel this is a text that has never grown up. And I think uh, Barry would have been one of the first people to be um, pleased that his uh, novel had morphed into a graphic novel. When um, uh, Streff, the author, uh, talked about this work, on Peter Pan, he was able to point out many of the references that he had incorporated into his adaptation. And um, as Barry was born in the village of Kirimuir, north of Dundee, and would later live at Motbury House in Dumfries, um, Stephen was able to incorporate elements of both houses and their locales into his book. And I was particularly um, keen in this presentation to look at graphic novels for the full range of age within the secondary school. So I think perhaps that one is one of the ones that lends itself uh, more towards perhaps the BGE, the S13 
uh, age range of the curriculum. And you could do a really interesting classroom study uh, looking at perhaps the novel version, the graphic novel version, and maybe one of the very many film adaptations that there's been. And it would make a nice multimodal, multimedia uh, study of the text. And then because I also wanted to look at uh, some graphic novels in uh, Scots, um, I wanted to look at uh, the Matthew Fitt translations of the Asterix books um, by uh, Goscinny, originally from Goscinny. And Matthew began translating these uh, from 2014. There are now nine in the series. And in fact, um, I think that's uh, one of the most makes them one of the most popular series. Um, Matthew was a huge Asterix fan originally, and he says he learned most of what he knows about the Gauls from the Asterix books, maybe draws into question some of the accuracy of his novels. But he thought that the these books would lend themselves well to being translated. And I think what I like about them is that Matthew has kept very much to the original humour of these books and even trying to build in the puns which are so much a feature of the Asterix books. I'm delighted that one of the books was nominated for a Scots Language Award, uh, the one about the Olympic Games. And I think these are these graphic novels would prove very popular within your classrooms. Another series that's also been tackled uh, in Scots is the Hershey's Adventures of Tintin. And these have been translated from the original French by uh, one of my University of Glasgow colleagues, Dr. Susan Rennie. And she has taken these um, books and translated them into Scots. The two latest ones you'll see um, highlighted on the screen as being Spang New, um, uh, the first two there on the slide. Um, Susan's translations have run into a tiny bit of a problem um, because sometimes there are some words that just don't translate well or which actually would cause confusion. And not the least is the first one of these uh, that you see there, the Dark Isle, um, is actually, I think, the original um, Tintin version is the Black Isle, but she couldn't call it that in Scots because it would confuse it too much with the geographical area of the Black Isle. And so I think that's something that uh, is something for you to watch out from. Again, great feature of these books is their humour and their uh, the way they remain true to the original graphic novel books. The next ones I've called, um, for want of a better title, I've called from the original material. And these are graphic novels that are published not from kind of publishing houses, but from elsewhere. And the first one I want to talk about is John Muir, Earth, Planet, Universe. And uh, this is actually written by the children's and young adult uh, author Julie Bertagna. And uh, the first two pictures you'll see on this slide, what, the first is the front cover of the um, graphic novel, and one is a, an illustration from the inside of the novel. And um, this book details John Muir's life from his childhood in the Scottish countryside to his tireless work exploring, enjoying, and protecting America's wild places. The book is uh, available as a free PDF download from the Scottish Book Trust website. And in these times of school budgets and strapped cash, I think a free download is always to be welcomed. And I think the subject matter of this particular picture uh, graphic novel is very opposite given uh, the COP26 uh, conference that's happening shortly in Glasgow and with so much attention being paid to climate change, sustainability, care for the planet and it would make a very interesting and relevant uh, version um, in terms of uh, classroom study. The next one is called Walk the Walk and it was developed by the Scottish Book Trust in partnership with the Scottish Government to explore issues around sectarianism and how to tackle it. The resources 
focus on facilitated group discussion and activities that learners can actually do on their own or in small groups. And so if you go onto the Scottish Book Trust website and look at the material on this, you'll find it's almost like an interactive picture book with various things to respond to and come back on. And again, um, I think you'll find it's a, a, an interesting take on the topic of sectarianism. And as you'll see from the uh, illustrations, the target audience is probably about kind of 15, 16 year olds. The next uh, graphic novel on the slide is called Gears Peace. And this comes from Inverclyde Communities Development Trust. And this was a, an initiative, the Geese Peace was an anti-sectarian initiative, working with individuals and groups throughout Inverclyde, again, to explore the issue of sectarianism, but this time focusing on uh, using creative approaches. Uh, working with schools and community settings, the project aimed to raise awareness of sectarianism and hate crime and open up discussions around these issues. And I've chosen this particular one. If you go on to the Inverclyde Community Development Trust's website, there are a number of graphic novels that again are free to download. I chose this one because it, it was actually created by St Ninian's Primary School from Inverclyde, working with um, in a workshop with specialist uh, comic creators and graphic artists. And they created their own picture book on the topic. And I think it works very, very well. And again, it's something that could be used perhaps as a model text if you were looking to actually create your own graphic novel in the classroom. The final one I want to look at from this, uh, in this original material is also um, from um, Scottish Book Trust. And this time they worked in partnership with a finance company who were keen to try to help um, Scottish youngsters to become kind of financially aware. And um, they came up with this graphic novel called Skint. Um, again, you can freely download this from the Scottish Book Trust website. The words are by Gowan Calder and the illustrations are by Sandra Mars and John Chalmers whom you might know perhaps as the graphic novel company Metafrog. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that company in, in a couple of slides on. I then wanted to look at um, graphic novels that came from Scottish publishers. And I want to start by looking at Warren Police's graphic novel called Freedom Bound which follows the interconnected stories of three enslaved people living in Scotland before Scots law proved slavery to be illegal. And these stories take you from the mountainous countryside of Scotland to the inner city. Freedom, uh, Freedom Bound explores Scot Scotland's somewhat unsettling history of slavery and the injustices perpetrated throughout the decades. This particular graphic novel was created in conjunction with the University of Glasgow with the purpose of educating Scottish young people about the history of slavery in the country. The Full Colour Anthology, the next one in the, on the slide, uh, brings together the freshest voices in Scottish comics and collects their short form work into one stunning volume. This uh, emerged from the Full Colour Project, created to foster diversity in comics and to mentor young people from Black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds. And the, the project came to a very successful uh, conclusion with this collection of bold new comics from these brand new comic artists and writers. The next book comes from that company I talked about in the earlier slide, Metafrog. Um, they are an award-winning graphic novel company, um, and this is their latest. Uh, they have taken uh, the classic folk tale of Bluebeard, and they have translated it into a feminist fairy tale, 
about the blossoming of a young child to womanhood striving for independence. Eve spends an idyllic childhood of summer days with her sweetheart Tom and together they dream of exploring the world but that dream is soon shattered when she comes of age. The mysterious character Bluebeard is looking for a new bride and he has set his sights on Eve and rumour has it that his former wives have all disappeared. So this graphic novel leads us to think, what will Eve find in the castle beyond the enchanted forest? A forbidden chamber, a golden key, and the most terrifying secret take on a new life in this gothic graphic novel. And again, I think this um, lends itself very well to uh, a study of fairy tales and about reimagined fairy tales and about, um, whole issues to do with fairy tales, particularly about the gendered nature of fairy tales as we often uh, see them and know them. And so this is a fascinating uh, way to explore um, fairy tales for their origins and for their uh, purposes. And the last one that we have on this slide is a graphic novel called We Shall Fight Until We Win. Now, this is a non-fiction graphic novel and it was um, to it was published to celebrate a century of pioneering women, marking the centenary of the first wave of women gaining the right to vote in the UK. It acknowledges the trailblazing women who fought for equality. It celebrates some political firsts, and it also celebrates those who continue the fight today. We also. Uh, are shown some particular characters who remained excluded in 1918 uh, and how they continued their own fight for years to come. So again, it's, it shows you that the graphic novel can be uh, both fiction and non-fiction based. And the last slide I want to look at is um, Two, set, two series of graphic novels that have particular um, resonance with our current context um, in pandemic or even maybe, dare I say, post-pandemic Scotland. The first of these is uh, called Plagued, and it's the first book in our, um, the Miranda Chronicles, a three book series. It's set in the near future, and Scotland has been left devastated by a plague that has swept the country. The scattered population struggle to survive from day to day, and the blame for this pandemic falls squarely on witches. Seemingly ordinary people with extraordinary powers who are hunted down and forced to stand trial by government sanctioned witch hunters. Thomas Mackay is one of those um, witch hunter characters, and alongside his dog Dex, he hunts down witches in order to save enough money and buy his way to a better life, far from poverty and devastation. But things take a somewhat unexpected turn when Mackay's latest target, a witch called Miranda Lee, blackmails him into helping her act out a dangerous plot to cure the plague once and for all. Now, that's the first book in the series. There are now two further books in the series, the last one published just this year. And um, I think given our recent experience of life in Scotland, I think these may well speak to a young audience. The final um, series I want to look at are um, Diamond Steel's Saltire series. Um, and this uh, set of comics um, first came about because of John Ferguson's, the author of the, of the series, um, who came across a quite derogatory online article uh, that suggested it was a daft idea for Scotland to have its own superhero, as the country was too boring, drich and drab, and that even if it did, it would probably be called Drunk Man. Now, he thought that was rather unfair of what he sees as a very vibrant country. He had always had a big interest in the superhero genre and also in mythology. 
and thought that comic book heroes, uh, superheroes, are essentially examples of modern mythology. The Spider-Mans, the Batmans, Supermans, the Hulks of the world exist because America is such a new country. It doesn't have old myths um, and old world uh, or heroes of the past to point to. So they created new ones. Scotland is one of the oldest countries in the Western world and has more mythology, legends and folklore than you can st shake a stick at, uh, even if it's not always very well known. And as superheroes are based on mythology, it seems odd to suggest that Scotland could not have one of its own. So he took those two ideas of superheroes and mythology and stuck them together. Scottish history is almost a story in itself, so they decided to do a pseudo history of the country. As readers, we often don't know our own history very well. People are aware that the Romans came to Scotland, but they aren't very sure of what happened. Same with the Angles and the Saxons or the Vikings. And so Ferguson thought, perfect, stick a giant blue superhero in there and fill in the blanks. Since people don't exactly know how these victories were achieved, he felt free then to throw in a bit of a fantasy element. In the mix in these books are elements of Beowulf, the Lord of the Rings, Conan, the Justice League of America, and the X-Men. Now, I'm aware that yet again, this has been a whistle-stop tour of what is available. I'm happy for people to contact me on my university email if you would like to know more. Thank you very much for your attention this afternoon. Bye. <laughs>